Chapter 1 Early Life in Kentucky In the green and rolling hills of Kentucky, on June 3, 1808, a baby boy named Jefferson Davis was born. He came into the world in a little place called Fairview. The air was fresh, and the land was alive with nature's wonders. His family was proud and full of history. They had traveled from far lands to make a home in America. Young Jefferson's father, Samuel, was a strong man, always filled with stories of their family's adventures. Their family came from a line of brave fighters who had played their part in America's Revolutionary War. Jefferson was the youngest of ten children. With so many brothers and sisters, there was never a dull moment in the Davis home. They would play in the fields, run by the streams, and listen to their father's tales by the warm fireplace. Every day was a new adventure. As a child, Jefferson was curious and always asking questions. Why is the sky blue? How do birds fly? He was hungry for knowledge. His mother, Jane, would smile and tell him, One day you'll learn all the answers, my boy. The Kentucky land was rich and gave them food, but life was not always easy. Sometimes the weather was tough and crops failed, but the Davis family stuck together. They faced hardships and celebrated the good times as one. As the years passed, Jefferson grew taller and stronger. He helped his family on the farm, learning the value of hard work. The lessons he learned in these early years, from love and family to perseverance in tough times, shaped the man he would become. From the gentle guidance of his parents to the playful teasing of his siblings, young Jefferson's early years in Kentucky were filled with memories that would stay with him forever. These were the roots that gave strength to a future leader. Chapter 2 Education and West Point Jefferson's thirst for knowledge didn't go unnoticed. His parents, recognizing the spark in his eyes whenever he learned something new, decided it was time for him to get a formal education. They wanted to give him the best. Jefferson began his schooling at a small local academy. His days there were filled with reading, writing, and arithmetic. He loved his studies, often reading books late into the night. But young Jefferson yearned for more than what this small school could offer. His elder brother, Joseph, saw this hunger for learning in him. Joseph, always having a protective and guiding hand over Jefferson, made a bold decision. He said, Jefferson, it's time for you to attend a grander school, to learn more about the world and become the man you're meant to be. This grander school was none other than Transylvania University in Lexington, a place where the brightest minds gathered. Here, Jefferson was exposed to many subjects, from history to sciences, from languages to arts. It was a world he had never imagined. Yet, even as he relished the academic life, there was a call deep within him, a call for discipline, leadership, and service to his country. This call guided his next step, the United States Military Academy at West Point. West Point wasn't just any school. It was the nation's premier military academy. Young men went there to become leaders, to be molded into officers who would serve and protect their country. Jefferson was both excited and nervous, but he was ready. On his first day, the vastness of the campus, the stern-looking officers, and the disciplined routines were all overwhelming. But Jefferson took a deep breath and reminded himself, This is where I belong. Life at West Point was strict. Mornings began early with a bugle call, followed by rigorous physical training. Then there were classes filled with strategy, tactics, engineering, and more. But it wasn't all about studies and discipline. There were moments of camaraderie and fun, friendships that would last a lifetime. Jefferson faced challenges too. There were times he doubted himself, times he felt like giving up. But with every challenge came a lesson. He learned the value of teamwork, the importance of making tough decisions, and the pride of serving a purpose larger than oneself. One memorable incident occurred during a mock battle exercise. Jefferson, leading a group of cadets, had to make a quick decision. The enemy was approaching, and the odds seemed against them. With a deep breath, 
Using what he had learned and trusting his instincts, he made a bold move. It paid off. His team won the exercise, earning him the respect and admiration of both his peers and superiors. Years passed quickly. As graduation neared, Jefferson felt a mix of emotions. The boy who entered West Point had transformed into a confident young man, ready to take on the world. His teachers and mentors had seen potential in him and had helped shape his character and skills. On graduation day, wearing his crisp uniform, Jefferson stood tall. The sun shone brightly, reflecting off the rows of golden buttons on the cadet's jackets. The American flag fluttered in the wind. As Jefferson received his diploma, he felt a surge of pride. He was not just a graduate, he was a West Point graduate. That evening, as he gazed at the Hudson River, Jefferson reflected on his journey. From the green fields of Kentucky to the challenging halls of West Point, he had come a long way. The lessons learned and the friendships made would stay with him as he stepped into the next chapter of his life. West Point had not just educated Jefferson Davis. It had transformed him. He was now ready for the challenges that lay ahead, equipped with knowledge, discipline, and a burning desire to serve. Chapter 3. Military Service and the Black Hawk War Fresh from West Point, Jefferson Davis felt a mix of excitement and uncertainty. He was now an officer in the United States Army, a role filled with both honor and responsibility. The land of the free was his to protect, and he was eager to serve. Jefferson's early military days were spent in various forts, learning the day-to-day -day duties of a soldier. But life in the military wasn't just about drills and discipline. It was about camaraderie, about forming bonds that were as strong as family. At Fort Crawford, he met a fellow officer named Zachary Taylor. Little did Jefferson know that this man would not only become a significant figure in his life, but also play a crucial role in American history. In 1832, dark clouds began to gather on the horizon. A conflict was brewing between the native Sauk tribe and American settlers. The Sauk leader, Black Hawk, a warrior with a fierce spirit, aimed to reclaim his tribe's lost lands. This struggle would come to be known as the Black Hawk War. Jefferson, now a young lieutenant, was called to action. The raw beauty of the Midwest, with its sprawling prairies and dense forests, was about to become a battleground. Davis and his regiment were given the task of tracking down Black Hawk and his warriors. One evening, as the soldiers camped by a river, Jefferson sat by the fire, lost in thought. The dancing flames reminded him of his childhood in Kentucky, of simpler times. But duty called, and he knew he had to be ready for whatever lay ahead. The days that followed were filled with challenges. The terrain was rough, and the weather unpredictable. But the biggest challenge was the uncertainty. The Sauk warriors were skilled at guerrilla tactics, and every rustle in the bushes, every distant drumbeat, could signal danger. One fateful day, Jefferson's regiment received a tip-off about Black Hawk's whereabouts. With cautious optimism, they set out. The sun was beginning to set, casting a golden hue over the landscape. The soldiers moved stealthily, hoping to catch the Sauk warriors by surprise. But nature had other plans. A sudden downpour made the ground slippery, reducing visibility. The soldiers pressed on, but their progress was slow. And then, the unexpected happened. A sudden war cry echoed through the air, and arrows began to rain down. The ambush was swift and fierce. Jefferson, drawing from his West Point training, quickly rallied his men. The battle that followed was intense. The cries of men, the clash of weapons, and the drumbeats of war filled the air. Hours seemed like minutes, but finally, the sounds of battle began to fade. The Sauk warriors, realizing they were outnumbered, began to retreat. The aftermath was a sight Jefferson would never forget. The ground was littered with the fallen, both friend and foe. He felt a mix of relief and sorrow. While they had succeeded in their mission, the cost had been high. The Black Hawk War eventually came to an end 
with Black Hawk being captured and the Sock tribe forced to cede more of their lands. It was a bittersweet victory for the United States Army. For Jefferson, the war was a turning point. It gave him first-hand experience of the realities of battle, of the thin line between life and death. It also reinforced his belief in duty and service. He returned to Fort Crawford a changed man. His role in the Black Hawk War had earned him respect and admiration, but more importantly, it had shaped his character preparing him for the larger roles he was destined to play in the future. As he gazed out over the Mississippi River, Jefferson reflected on his journey so far. From the classrooms of West Point to the battlefields of the Midwest, he had faced challenges and emerged stronger. The road ahead was uncertain, but Jefferson Davis was ready. Chapter 4. Marriage and Personal Life Amid the rigor and discipline of military life, Jefferson Davis' heart harbored a softer side, one that yearned for companionship and love. It was at Fort Crawford that this side of him found a kindred spirit, Sarah Knox Taylor. Sarah was no ordinary young woman. She was the daughter of Zachary Taylor, Jefferson's superior officer. Her deep blue eyes and infectious smile had a warmth that immediately captivated young Jefferson. The two often found themselves stealing glances at each other, their hearts racing with the thrill of newfound love. However, their blossoming relationship was not without challenges. Sarah's father, Zachary, did not approve. He feared that military life would be too hard for his daughter, and he hoped for a different future for her. But love, as they say, always finds a way. Despite the hurdles, Jefferson and Sarah's bond only grew stronger. In 1835, with love overpowering all obstacles, the two decided to marry. The ceremony was simple, but filled with genuine emotions. Surrounded by close friends and family, they vowed to stand by each other through thick and thin. Tragically, their happiness was short-lived. Just three months after their wedding, both fell ill. While Jefferson recovered, Sarah did not. Her death was a blow that shattered Jefferson's world. He was left heartbroken, grappling with the cruel twist of fate. For a while, Jefferson lived like a shadow, his days filled with grief and memories of Sarah. He took a break from the military, needing time to heal and find his footing again. But life, with its mysterious ways, had another plan for him. On a visit to Mississippi, Jefferson's path crossed with a young, vivacious woman named Verena Banks Howell. Verena, with her wit and charm, brought a fresh breeze into Jefferson's somber world. She was intelligent, well-read, and had a modern perspective on life. Their conversations ranged from literature to politics, from art to the future of America. Jefferson, once again, found himself enchanted. The age gap between them, 18 years, mattered little. They shared a deep mutual respect and a love that was both passionate and tender. After a period of courtship, Jefferson and Verena decided to unite in marriage in 1845. Their life together was filled with ups and downs. They faced personal challenges, including the loss of some of their children. But through it all, they remained each other's pillars of strength. Verena stood by Jefferson during his most challenging times, especially during his political and leadership roles in the tumultuous years that followed. Their home, Breerfield, became a haven for them. Nestled in the Mississippi countryside, it was here that they raised their family, shared their dreams, and built a life together. The house echoed with laughter, debates, and the shared memories of a couple deeply in love. Jefferson's life had seen many phases, from a dedicated soldier to a grieving widower, from a passionate lover to a devoted husband. His marriages, first to Sarah, and then to Verena, revealed the depth of his emotions, the strength of his character, and his capacity to love and be loved. As the sun set over Brerfield, casting a warm glow over the sprawling estate, Jefferson often found himself reflecting on his journey. Love had both wounded him and healed him. It had brought him unimaginable pain and unparalleled joy, and as he looked into Verena's eyes, he knew that love was life's greatest gift. Chapter 5 Mississippi Politics 
After the twists and turns of military life and personal heartages, Jefferson Davis found himself drawn to a new arena, politics. The state of Mississippi, with its lush landscapes and spirited people, beckoned him to serve in a different capacity. In 1845, Mississippi, a state pulsing with energy and promise, was at the cusp of significant changes. The issues of the day were numerous, from the rising tensions between the North and South to debates over states' rights and slavery. The air was thick with anticipation and debate. It was during this time that Jefferson took his first steps into the political world. He was elected to the United States House of Representatives. The hallowed halls of Congress were a far cry from the military battlegrounds, yet they presented battles of a different kind, battles of ideology, strategy, and influence. In the House, Jefferson quickly became known for his eloquence and conviction. He was a passionate advocate for states' rights and often defended the Southern way of life. But more than his political views, it was his demeanor that stood out. Calm, composed, and articulate, he commanded respect from both allies and opponents. However, Jefferson's time in the House was brief. The call of the military beckoned again during the Mexican-American War, where he led with distinction, but Mississippi had not forgotten him. Bob on his return, he was appointed and later elected to the United States Senate, a testament to his growing influence and the trust the people placed in him. The Senate was a different beast. It was here that the nation's most crucial decisions were debated and made. Jefferson found himself among some of the brightest minds, including Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, and Stephen A. Douglas. The atmosphere was electric, filled with impassioned speeches, intense debates, and the weight of responsibility. Representing Mississippi, Jefferson was at the forefront of many critical issues. He championed the rights of Southern states and took a firm stand on the controversial topic of slavery. His speeches resonated with power and conviction, echoing the sentiments of many of his constituents. But politics, like any battlefield, had its challenges. There were alliances to be made, strategies to be crafted, and oppositions to be managed. Jefferson, with his military background, approached these challenges with discipline intact. He was not one to shy away from tough discussions or decisions. One notable moment was his passionate defense of Mississippi's interests during the debates on the Compromise of 1850, a series of bills aimed at diffusing tension between slave and free states. Jefferson's voice, firm and unwavering, echoed in the Senate chamber, encapsulating the hopes and fears of Mississippi. As years rolled on, Jefferson's influence in the Senate grew, but so did the rifts within the country. The storm clouds of civil unrest were gathering, and Jefferson, with his deep love for the South, found himself at the heart of the impending storm. In the quiet moments, away from the intensity of the Senate floor, Jefferson often reflected on his journey. From the battlefields to the political arenas, his life had been a series of challenges and triumphs. Representing Mississippi was not just a duty, it was an honor. An honor that he cherished and upheld with unwavering dedication. Chapter 6 Secretary of War The vast landscape of American politics was ever-changing, with each role and responsibility demanding its unique brand of leadership. Jefferson Davis, having showcased his capabilities in Mississippi's political scene, was soon to embark on another crucial journey. In 1853, a new opportunity knocked on his door, the role of United States Secretary of War under President Franklin Pierce. The grandeur of Washington, D.C., with its majestic buildings and monuments, stood as a testament to the nation's aspirations. It was here, in the bustling heart of the capital, that Jefferson would serve the nation in a different capacity. Stepping into the War Department, Jefferson felt the weight of his new responsibility. The office of the Secretary of War was no mere title. It held in its grasp the defense and security of the entire nation. The challenges were manifold, managing military posts, overseeing West Point, ensuring adequate defense resources, and dealing with Native American affairs. From the beginning, 
Jefferson approached his duties with the same vigor and dedication he displayed in all his roles. His military background proved invaluable. He understood the intricacies of army life, the needs of soldiers, and the importance of a robust defense system. One of Jefferson's first tasks was modernizing the military. He believed in the power of innovation and saw the potential in emerging technologies. Under his guidance, the military saw the introduction of new rifles, improved coastal fortifications, and the establishment of new routes for the transcontinental railroad. The vast American frontier, with its uncharted territories and indigenous tribes, presented its challenges. Jefferson, as Secretary of War, was often at the center of Native American policies. He advocated for peaceful negotiations and sought to strike a balance between the nation's expansion and the rights of its original inhabitants. His tenure also saw the expansion of the United States Capitol building, adding a touch of architectural grandeur to the nation's capital. Every brick laid, every decision made, was a reflection of his commitment to progress and national pride. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. Every decision, every policy, came under scrutiny. Critics were many, and the press, with its ever-watchful eye, was quick to pounce on any perceived misstep. Jefferson, however, stood his ground. He was not one to be swayed by criticism. Instead, he used it as a tool for reflection and improvement. Away from the public eye, in the quiet confines of his office, Jefferson often found himself deep in thought. The maps on his walls, the reports on his desk, were not just administrative tools. They were reminders of the vast, diverse nation he served. A nation of dreams, challenges, and endless possibilities. His bond with President Pierce was a special one. They shared mutual respect and trust, working hand in hand for the betterment of the country. Their combined vision was one of unity, progress, and prosperity. By the end of his tenure in 1857, Jefferson had left an indelible mark on the War Department. His contributions went beyond policies and infrastructure. He instilled a sense of purpose, pride, and dedication in the heart of the department. As he bid farewell to his role, the corridors of the War Department echoed with his legacy. A legacy of commitment, innovation, and unwavering love for the nation. Chapter 7 Tensions rise between North and South. America, in the mid-19th century, was a nation on the brink. Beneath the facades of progress and unity lay deep-rooted divisions, fraying the very fabric of the country. As Jefferson Davis navigated the waters of politics, the tides of tension between the North and South grew steadily, casting shadows over the nation's future. The North, with its bustling cities and growing industries, championed a vision of progress, innovation, and abolitionism. Smoke from factories painted the northern skies, signaling the dawn of a new industrial age. The streets echoed with the voices of reformers and abolitionists, advocating for an end to the age-old institution of slavery. Contrastingly, the South, with its sprawling plantations and agricultural richness, held on to traditions and a way of life deeply intertwined with slavery. Cotton fields stretched as far as the eye could see, a testament to the South's economic reliance on enslaved labor. Grand mansions stood amidst these fields, representing the wealth and power of plantation owners. Jefferson, with his roots in the South, was right at the heart of these tensions. His beliefs resonated with many Southerners. He viewed states' rights as paramount and believed in the right of each state to determine its destiny including its stance on slavery. But the winds of change were relentless. Events like the publication of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin stirred emotions in the North, painting a heart-wrenching picture of the lives of enslaved people. This book, along with the fierce debates in Congress, intensified the divisions. The controversial Kansas-Nebraska Act further fueled the fire. It proposed that the settlers of these territories decide for themselves whether to allow slavery. This led to violent clashes, earning the region the grim nickname Bleeding Kansas. As these events unfolded, Jefferson watched with growing concern. 
His speeches in the Senate were filled with emotion, echoing the sentiments of many in the South. He felt that the Southern way of life was under threat, not just from external critics, but also from the growing anti-slavery sentiment within the country. Private discussions in the homes of the South became heated. Dinner tables turned into debate platforms, with family members and friends dissecting the latest news and speculating about the future. Whispers of secession, once considered extreme, began to circulate more frequently. Jefferson, ever the statesman, believed in dialogue and compromise. He hoped that the differences between the North and South could be bridged, preserving the Union. But as events escalated, even he began to doubt the possibility of a peaceful resolution. The election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 was the tipping point. A known opponent of slavery's expansion, Lincoln's presidency was seen by many in the South as a direct challenge to their way of life. Jefferson, sensing the gravity of the situation, was torn. He loved the United States, the country he had served in various capacities. But he also felt a deep loyalty to the South, its people, and its values. The stage was set for one of the most tumultuous periods in American history. Jefferson Davis, once a soldier, senator, and secretary, was now on the precipice of a role he never anticipated, in a nation on the verge of tearing itself apart. Chapter 8. Davis. The Senator and the Union. The United States Senate, with its grand chambers and weighty decisions, has always been a place where the nation's fate is molded. Jefferson Davis, as a senator from Mississippi, was well acquainted with the gravity of this role. As tensions mounted and the nation's fabric strained, Davis found himself at the heart of the storm, wrestling with the ideals of a united nation. Upon his return to the Senate, after his tenure as Secretary of War, the atmosphere was palpably different. The echoing corridors and whispered conversations hinted at the underlying disquiet. The nation was on a knife's edge, and every senator, including Davis, felt the responsibility keenly. Jefferson's position was a complex one. His southern roots and beliefs aligned with many in the South who felt marginalized and threatened by the changing national discourse. Yet, his love for the Union and its ideals was genuine. He had served the United States loyally in various capacities and believed in the dream of a united nation. In the Senate, Davis became a voice of reason amidst the growing clamor. His speeches were eloquent, passionate, and reflective of the South's concerns. He championed states' rights, arguing that each state should be allowed to determine its path. He fervently believed that the federal government should not impose its will, especially on sensitive matters like slavery. Yet, even as he argued for states' rights and the Southern way of life, he spoke of the Union with reverence. He often recalled the nation's founding principles, urging his fellow senators to remember the dreams of the Founding Fathers. Davis believed that unity was possible, that differences could be resolved through dialogue and understanding. But the chasm between the North and South was widening. Events outside the Senate chambers, from bleeding Kansas to Lincoln's election, only intensified the divisions. The once respected institution of the Senate was increasingly seen as a battleground where ideological wars were fought with words and policies. Amidst this turmoil, Davis' personal struggles mirrored the nation's. His loyalty to Mississippi and the South pulled him in one direction, while his commitment to the Union tugged at his heartstrings. He was torn between two worlds, trying to bridge them, even as they seemed determined to drift apart. There were moments of quiet reflection for Davis, often in the solitude of his office or his Mississippi home. He pondered the future, weighing the costs of division against the dream of unity. Would the union he loved so deeply survive the storms? Or would the dream shatter, giving way to two distinct nations? As the 1860s dawned, Davis' role in the Senate became even more crucial. With every speech, every debate, he tried to be a beacon of hope, urging reconciliation. But the tides of history were moving swiftly, and even the most passionate pleas could not halt their progress. By the time Davis delivered his farewell address to the Senate in 1861, the writing was on the wall. 
The Union, as it was known, was on the brink of dissolution. Davis, with a heavy heart, acknowledged the impending reality, even as he clung to the hope that peace and unity might someday return. His journey in the Senate had been one of passion, dedication, and an unwavering belief in the Union. As he stepped away from the Grand Chambers, he left behind not just a political legacy, but a testament to the complexities of love, loyalty, and nationhood. Chapter 9 The Birth of the Confederacy The 1860s were a time of great upheaval and uncertainty in the United States. The nation, once united under a shared vision and common goals, found itself torn apart by deeply entrenched beliefs and societal values. At the heart of this division was the issue of slavery, and as tensions reached a boiling point, a new nation was born, the Confederate States of America. The year 1860 saw the election of Abraham Lincoln, a man known for his anti-slavery stance. His election was met with grave concern by southern states, who viewed it as a direct threat to their way of life. For many, the idea of a United States without slavery was unthinkable, and the seeds of secession were sown. State after state in the southern region began to voice their dissent. They felt marginalized, believing that their values, culture, and economic interests were being sidelined by the increasingly dominant North. Meetings were held, debates raged, and decisions were made. One by one, Starting with South Carolina in December of 1860, states began to secede from the Union. Amid this backdrop of rising tensions and political maneuvers, a convention was held in Montgomery, Alabama, in early 1861. Here, representatives from the seceded states came together with a singular vision to form a new confederation that would uphold their beliefs and values. And so the Confederate States of America was born. But every nation needs a leader, someone to guide it, especially in its formative years. The delegates deliberated, and their choice was clear. Jefferson Davis Davis, with his distinguished background in both military and politics, seemed the perfect choice. He had served valiantly in the Black Hawk and Mexican-American Wars and had held significant positions, including that of the United States Secretary of War. But more than his credentials, it was Davis' unwavering belief in the Southern cause that made him the ideal leader for the fledgling nation. However, being chosen as the president of the Confederacy was no ceremonial role. It was a heavy mantle to bear. Davis was acutely aware of the challenges ahead. The Confederacy was not just fighting for its beliefs. It was fighting for its very existence. He knew that leading this new nation would mean leading it to war. The formation of the Confederacy was met with mixed reactions. For its supporters, it was a beacon of hope, a promise of a future where their values and ways of life would be protected. They saw in Davis a leader who would champion their cause with determination and valor. However, for the Union and its supporters, the birth of the Confederacy was a grave threat. It wasn't just about territorial integrity. It was about the very soul of the nation. The stage was set for one of the bloodiest and most defining chapters in American history, the Civil War. Davis, standing at the helm of the Confederacy, would navigate through storms of conflict, challenges of leadership, and the weight of a nation's hopes. The birth of the Confederacy was not just a political event. It was a turning point, a moment that would shape the course of history. Chapter 10. Leaving the South. Civil War Begins. The 1860s dawned with a cloud of uncertainty. America, the land of dreams and unity, was on the cusp of its darkest hour. As states seceded and allegiances shifted, Jefferson Davis found himself in an unexpected role, the President of the Confederate States of America. The weight of leadership was immense, and the shadows of conflict loomed large. Montgomery, Alabama, 1861 the Confederate capital buzzed with anticipation. Davis, with his military background and political prowess, seemed a natural choice to lead the South, but he knew the challenges ahead were daunting. Unity within the Confederacy was fragile, resources were limited, and the might of the Union Army stood against them. Davis' first order of business was to form a government and solidify the South's defenses. 
He understood the importance of strategy, and with a team of trusted advisors, they charted the path forward. Forts were fortified, soldiers recruited, and plans laid out. The first major test came at Fort Sumter in South Carolina. The fort, held by Union forces but located in Confederate territory, became a flashpoint. Its eventual fall to the Confederates in April 1861 signaled the beginning of open hostilities. The Civil War had officially begun. As the leader of the Confederacy, Davis was ever-present. He was not just a figurehead. He was actively involved in strategizing and decision-making. Battles like Bull Run and the Siege of Yorktown saw the Confederacy claim early victories. Davis' leadership and the valiant efforts of Confederate generals like Robert E. Lee bolstered the South's morale. Yet, war is never straightforward. For every victory, there were setbacks. Battles like Shiloh and Antietam were bloody and devastating. Davis felt each loss deeply. He mourned for the young lives lost, and the families shattered. Richmond, Virginia became the new capital of the Confederacy and Davis' base of operations. From here, he coordinated military campaigns, managed scarce resources, and addressed the concerns of his people. Letters from soldiers and families filled his desk, each telling a story of hope, despair, sacrifice, or love. Despite the challenges, Davis remained resolute. He frequently visited battlefronts, meeting with generals and soldiers, understanding ground realities, and boosting morale. His speeches to the Confederate people were passionate, urging them to stay strong, to fight for their beliefs, and to envision a future where the South was free and sovereign. But as the war dragged on, the strains began to show. The Union's naval blockade choked the South's economy. Shortages of food, medicine, and basic supplies became common. The war's toll on the civilian population was heart-wrenching. Davis, though steadfast, was not immune to the pain and suffering around him. The initial years of the Civil War were a roller coaster of emotions. Hope, despair, pride, and sorrow intertwined, reflecting the complex tapestry of a nation at war with itself. Davis, at the helm of the Confederacy, was both its leader and its beacon. He symbolized the South's spirit, resilience, and determination to forge its destiny. As this chapter of the war concluded, many uncertainties lay ahead. Battles won and lost were but milestones in a journey. The true test was of endurance, belief, and the will to persevere, with Davis leading the charge. Chapter 11. Challenges of Leadership the mantle of leadership is never easy, and for Jefferson Davis, it was exceptionally challenging. Leading the Confederate States of America during the Civil War meant navigating not just external battles, but also internal strife, political debates, and the weight of expectations from millions. At the heart of the Confederacy, Richmond became the epicenter of decisions, debates, and dilemmas. Davis' office was a whirlwind of activity. Generals, politicians, diplomats, and citizens all looked to him for direction. Each decision had repercussions, and Davis, with his astute mind, grappled with them daily. Externally, the might of the Union Army was a constant pressure. Their resources, numbers, and industrial strength posed a formidable challenge. Every military campaign, every strategy had to be planned considering these realities. Davis, with his military background, was deeply involved in these strategies, often clashing with his generals over the best course of action. Yet, it wasn't just the Union that Davis had to contend with. Across the Atlantic, Europe watched the Civil War with keen interest. Davis hoped for recognition and support from European powers, particularly Britain and France. Diplomatic efforts were constant, trying to win them over to the Confederate cause. The blockade of southern ports by the Union Navy added another layer of complexity, hindering trade and the Confederacy's ability to garner international support. Internally, Davis faced a myriad of challenges. The Confederacy, while united in its desire for secession, was a patchwork of states with varying interests and priorities. Balancing these interests was a delicate act. There were debates over states' rights, 
the very principle on which the Confederacy was founded, versus the need for a strong central authority to effectively wage the war. Economic pressures were relentless. The Confederate dollar fluctuated wildly, and as the war dragged on, inflation soared, basic necessities became luxuries. Davis had to manage these economic challenges while ensuring that the Confederate Army was well supplied and prepared. But perhaps the most personal challenge for Davis was the weight of public expectation. The South looked to him as a beacon of hope. Yet, as the war's reality set in, there were murmurs of discontent. Some questioned his leadership, others his decisions. The press was often critical, and Davis, though stoic, felt the sting of such criticisms. Amidst these pressures, Davis' health waned. He was often fatigued, and the stress of leadership took its toll. But he persevered, driven by a sense of duty and the belief in the Confederate cause. By his side, Verena Davis, his wife, was a pillar of strength, offering solace and counsel in the stormiest of times. Leadership is as much about strength as it is about vulnerability. Davis' tenure as the president of the Confederacy was marked by both. He showed resilience in the face of adversity, courage in the face of doubt, and an unwavering commitment to the Southern cause. Yet, he was also human with moments of doubt, exhaustion, and heartbreak. As the Confederacy's journey unfolded, Davis' leadership was its compass. The challenges were many, but so were the moments of pride, unity, and determination. Through the highs and lows, Davis' leadership was a testament to the complexities of leading in times of unparalleled crisis. Chapter 12 The War's Toll on Davis The dimming candlelight cast a soft glow over Davis' study in Richmond. Papers lay scattered across his desk, letters filled with both hope and despair. As the Civil War raged on, the toll on Jefferson Davis, both personally and politically, deepened. Each day brought a cascade of challenges, and the burden weighed heavy on his shoulders. The Confederacy began with high spirits and a burning passion for its cause. But as months turned into years, the reality of a prolonged war began to seep in. The once fiery zeal was gradually replaced with fatigue, doubt, and the painful realization of the Confederacy's weakening position. Davis, who began his tenure with unshakable resolve, felt this shift acutely. Each military setback was a personal blow. The South's losses at key battles like Gettysburg and Vicksburg weren't just strategic failures. They were wounds to Davis' heart. He had sent many young men to fight, and he mourned each life lost. His health deteriorated under the strain. Often pale and drawn, Davis suffered bouts of illness, further weakening his physical state. Sleep was elusive, with worries about the Confederacy's future and the well-being of its people constantly plaguing his mind. Personal challenges weren't limited to health. Davis' family was his anchor, but the war took its toll on them as well. His wife, Verena, though a steadfast support, was deeply affected by the criticisms directed at her husband. Their children, too, were not spared from the war's shadow. The death of their son, Joseph, in an accident was a profound personal tragedy for the Davis family. Grief intertwined with the larger sorrow of the Confederacy's struggles, making each day a test of endurance. Politically, Davis faced mounting pressure. As the war's tide turned against the South, dissent grew. There were whispers of dissatisfaction, even within the Confederate government. Some criticized his leadership style as too autocratic. Others questioned his military strategies. The press, once supportive, grew increasingly critical. Each negative headline, each editorial doubting Davis' decisions added to his anguish. The blockade of the South's ports by the Union Navy crippled the economy. Shortages became the norm, leading to unrest and frustration among the people. Davis, deeply empathetic, felt their pain. He wrestled with ways to alleviate their suffering, all the while knowing that the true relief would only come with victory. A prospect that seemed increasingly distant. Throughout these challenges, Davis sought solace in his faith and the belief in the righteousness of the Confederate cause. He turned to the Bible for guidance and strength. 
In his private moments, he often penned personal reflections, trying to make sense of the whirlwind of emotions and challenges he faced. But amidst the storm, Davis' determination never wavered. He believed in the South, its people, and its destiny. Every setback was met with renewed vigor, every criticism countered with resolve. He rallied his generals, addressed his people with passion, and worked tirelessly to keep the flame of the Confederacy alive. Yet, as the chapters of the war unfolded, the weariness was evident. Davis' once robust figure seemed to shrink, his eyes reflecting the depth of his trials. The toll of leadership, the weight of a nation's hopes, and the shadows of personal challenges combined to test the very limits of his strength and spirit. The war, in all its brutality, wasn't just about battles and territories. It was a deeply human struggle, with leaders like Davis bearing the brunt of its emotional and political weight. As this chapter of the war drew to a close, Davis' resilience, his sacrifices, and his indomitable spirit became emblematic of the larger Southern narrative. Chapter 13 The Fall of the Confederacy The sun began to set, casting a golden hue over Richmond, but the beauty of the dusk was juxtaposed with an air of despair. The Civil War, which had raged for years, was drawing to a close, and with it, the dreams of the Confederate States of America. Jefferson Davis, once a beacon of hope for the South, now stood at the epicenter of its downfall. The war's final years had seen the Confederacy's position weaken. Despite early successes and the valiant efforts of its army, the relentless power and resources of the Union began to tilt the balance. Battles that once ended in stalemates or narrow Confederate victories started turning decisively in favor of the Union. Places like Sherman's march to the sea devastated the South, both materially and mentally. The Confederate lines, stretched thin and tired, began to break. For Davis, each defeat was deeply personal. He had given his heart and soul to the Confederate cause, and witnessing its unraveling was agonizing. The cries of the wounded, the reports of lost territories, and the ever-growing list of casualties weighed on him, each a heavy stone adding to his burden. Richmond, the Confederate capital, once buzzing with activity and hope, now echoed with whispers of concern. The war's tide had turned, and the city's fall seemed imminent. As Union forces approached, Davis had to face the reality of evacuation. The once unthinkable was now inevitable. The exodus from Richmond was heart-wrenching. Families, their lives uprooted, left behind their homes, memories, and a part of their souls. For Davis, leaving the capital was akin to leaving behind a dream. A dream that he and countless others had fought for, believed in, and cherished. The Confederate government relocated, but it was clear that their days were numbered. As Davis moved southward, he held meetings, sent out orders, and tried to rally the troops, but the challenges were insurmountable. The Confederate Army, lacking resources and morale, was a shadow of its former self. Amidst this backdrop of despair, Davis received the news of General Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. It was a moment that marked the effective end of the Confederacy. The leader who had stood unyielding, who had given voice to the Southern cause, was left with a shattered dream. The subsequent days were a blur. Davis was captured by Union forces in Georgia. The leader of the Confederacy, once revered and powerful, was now a prisoner. His capture was symbolic of the South's fall. In the aftermath, the South was left scared and defeated. Plantations lay in ruins, cities were burned, and families were torn apart. The economic and social fabric of the region was forever altered. Yet, amidst the ashes of defeat, there were embers of resilience. For Davis, post-war life was a journey of reflection and resilience. Although he faced trial and imprisonment, his spirit remained undeterred. He became a symbol of the South's enduring spirit, a testament to its values, struggles, and hopes. The fall of the Confederacy was not just a chapter in history. It was a tapestry of human stories, dreams, and aspirations. It was a testament to the resilience of the human spirit in the face of adversity. 
And at the heart of this narrative stood Jefferson Davis, a man whose life was inextricably linked with the fate of the Confederacy. Chapter 14 Imprisonment and Trials The echoes of cannon fire had faded, replaced by the haunting silence of a nation torn apart. In the aftermath of the Civil War, Jefferson Davis, once the President of the Confederate States, now found himself shackled by the very Union he had opposed. Davis' capture in Georgia marked the beginning of a harrowing chapter in his life. He was taken to Fort Monroe in Virginia, a formidable military fortress, and imprisoned. The heavy iron bars and cold stone walls of his cell stood in stark contrast to the grandeur of his presidential office in Richmond. Gone were the days of leading a nation. Davis was now a captive, stripped of his power and freedom. His cell was small, damp, and dimly lit. A single window high above, let in slivers of sunlight, casting faint shadows on the cold floor. Davis, despite his circumstances, remained resilient. He penned letters to his wife, Verena, expressing his love and concern for their family, and reassuring her of his unwavering spirit. But imprisonment was more than just physical confinement. It was a psychological battle. Davis was isolated from the outside world, with limited visitors and news. The weight of defeat, the uncertainty of his fate, and the longing for his family wore on his mind and spirit. The North was divided over what to do with Davis. Some called for his execution, branding him a traitor. Others, keen on healing the nation's wounds, advocated for leniency. The debate raged on, and Davis' fate hung in the balance. Finally, after two years of confinement, Davis was formally charged with treason. The legal proceedings that followed were fraught with tension. The courtroom was packed, the air thick with anticipation. Davis, always dignified, stood tall, facing his accusers. His defense team argued passionately. They contended that Davis, as the leader of the Confederacy, had acted on behalf of his state and its people. He had followed a path he believed was constitutionally justified. The prosecution, on the other hand, painted Davis as a rebel who had torn the nation apart. But the trial was more than just about Davis. It was about the South, its values, and its place in the post-war United States. It was a reckoning of the nation's past and a glimpse into its future. Months passed, and the trial made slow progress. The nation watched closely waiting for a verdict. However, the case was fraught with legal complexities. And then, in a turn of events, the charges against Davis were dropped. The government, perhaps fearing the potential consequences of a guilty verdict or recognizing the need for national healing, decided not to proceed. Davis was released on bail, paid by prominent citizens, some even from the North, symbolizing the desire for reconciliation. Emerging from imprisonment, Davis was a changed man. The weight of the past years, the loss of the Confederacy, and the trials had taken their toll. Yet, in his eyes burned the unyielding spirit that had defined his life. He would spend his remaining years reflecting on the war, writing and advocating for the South's place in the reunited nation. Imprisonment and trials were but chapters in the remarkable life of Jefferson Davis, a testament to the resilience and strength of character that marked his journey. Chapter 15 Later Years and Reflections The shadows of the Civil War had long since faded, replaced by a new era of reconstruction and healing. The once battle-scared land was now dotted with burgeoning cities, and the nation was on a path to unity. But for Jefferson Davis, the past was never truly gone. It lingered in the recesses of his mind, a tapestry of memories and reflections. After his release, Davis sought solace in the company of his beloved family. They settled in Beauvoir, Mississippi, a beautiful estate overlooking the tranquil Gulf of Mexico. Here, surrounded by the gentle lull of waves and the warmth of southern sun, Davis found a place of refuge and reflection. Despite the trauma and trials of the past, Davis' indomitable spirit shone through. He wasn't one to retreat into obscurity. He took up writing, pouring his thoughts, emotions, and experiences into detailed accounts. His most significant work, 
The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, was a detailed chronicle of the Confederacy's formation, its battles, and eventual demise. Through this magnum opus, Davis sought to present the Southern perspective, shedding light on the reasons, aspirations, and challenges faced by the Confederacy. For Davis, writing was more than just documenting history. It was cathartic, a means of coming to terms with the tumultuous events of his life. He wrote of the valiant Southern soldiers, the challenges of leadership, and the heart-wrenching decisions he had to make. But most importantly, he wrote of the Southern ideals, the belief in states' rights, and the love for their land. Yet, Davis' reflections weren't solely confined to the past. The post-war South was grappling with its place in the Union, its identity, and its future. Davis often shared his views on reconciliation and the importance of preserving Southern heritage. He became a voice of wisdom, a bridge between the old and the new. His later years, though marked by moments of tranquility, weren't without challenges. The once powerful leader often faced criticism and was at times ostracized. However, with the unwavering support of his wife, Verena, and the love of his children, Davis weathered these storms. Davis also took time to travel, visiting various southern states. Wherever he went, he was met with mixed reactions. Some revered him as a hero, a symbol of the southern cause, while others saw him as a reminder of a painful past. Through it all, Davis remained dignified, engaging in discourse and championing the values he held dear. As the years went by, age began to take its toll on Davis. His once robust frame grew frail, and the weight of his years was evident. Yet, his spirit remained undiminished. In his final days, surrounded by loved ones, Davis looked out to the vast horizon of Beauvoir. Perhaps he saw not just the setting sun, but also the hopes, dreams, and sacrifices of a bygone era. Jefferson Davis passed away in 1889, but his legacy endured. Through his writings, speeches, and life, he left an indelible mark on the tapestry of American history. He was a man of conviction, resilience, and reflection, forever intertwined with the story of the South. Chapter 16 Legacy and Historical Impact the pages of history are filled with figures whose actions, decisions, and beliefs shape the course of nations. Jefferson Davis is undoubtedly one such figure. As the President of the Confederate States of America, his role in the Civil War and its aftermath ensured his place in the annals of American history. But how does history view him today, and what is his lasting legacy? In the years immediately following the Civil War, opinions about Davis were sharply divided. To many in the South, he was a hero, a symbol of resistance against what they viewed as Northern aggression. They celebrated his unwavering commitment to the Southern cause and his dedication to the principles of states' rights. Statues were erected, and stories of his leadership were passed down through generations. Conversely, in the North, Davis was often vilified. He was seen as a traitor, a leader of a rebellious movement that threatened to tear the United States apart. The pain and devastation of the Civil War were fresh, and for many, Davis embodied the conflict and division. As time passed and wounds began to heal, perspectives on Davis began to evolve. Historians delve deeper into his life, analyzing his leadership style, decisions, and the challenges he faced. They painted a more nuanced picture highlighting not just his role in the war, but also his contributions as a senator and secretary of war. Davis' writings, especially the rise and fall of the Confederate government, also played a significant role in shaping perceptions. Through his detailed accounts, future generations got a glimpse into the mindset of the Confederate leadership, their motivations, and their understanding of the events that unfolded. However, history is often a mirror, reflecting the values and beliefs of the present. As the 20th century progressed, debates surrounding civil rights, racial equality, and the legacy of slavery brought renewed scrutiny to Davis and the Confederate cause. The symbols and monuments associated with the Confederacy became points of contention, sparking discussions about their place in modern America. 
Today, Davis remains a complex and often polarizing figure. Some view him as a champion of states' rights, a man who stood by his convictions even in the face of overwhelming odds. Others see him as a symbol of a dark chapter in American history, one that championed the institution of slavery. Yet, amidst these debates, one thing is clear. Jefferson Davis' impact on American history is undeniable. His leadership during one of the nation's most tumultuous periods, his reflections on the Confederate cause, and his place in the larger narrative of the United States ensure that his legacy will be discussed, debated, and analyzed for generations to come.